I'm Hunter Jones, pro surfer and filmmaker. And I'm Lex Weinstein, surfer and environmental activist. We're going on an epic road trip exploring iconic California surf towns. Exploring the waves and people that make these towns so influential on global surf culture, past, present, and future. And of course, tasting the best burritos along the way. Welcome to Detour Surf Towns, presented by Hydroflask. Your favorite thing about Encinitas? This is definitely a town all about art, film, music, style, culture, as well as like the history is all flower farms and surfing. Wave rich too. Very wave rich, yeah. We have a lot of really beautiful spots here. And How many waves would you say are like in the sun? You're gonna make me blow. How many waves? <laughs> How many waves, like? Uh, I don't know. There's like probably four major surf breaks here that are like pretty epic. Encinitas is the traditional and unceded homeland of the Payamcoitian people. They are also known as the Luceno as a result of their history with the Mission San Luis Rey in Oceanside. The seven bands of Payamcoitian peoples are located in today's San Diego and Riverside counties. Payamcoitian people also acknowledge that prior to its name of Encinitas, the land was shared territory with the Kumeyaay. While Huntington Beach in Orange County has earned the title Surf City, the Encinitas area has, over the decades, put its soul into California surfing. Today, the stretch of coast between San Alijo Lagoon to the south and Batiquitos Lagoon to the north is also home to perhaps the state's most diverse surfing community. Where else would you find one of the world's epicenters of stylish surfing? Home to flow masters like Joel and Tosh Tudor, Rob Machado, Ryan Birch, and Zach Flores, located mere blocks away from the Cardiff Kook, the most unstylish surf statue ever conceived, or landmarks that for years have drawn legions of the faithful, like the Self-Realization Fellowship Temple, founded in 1937, and the venerable Hanson and Encinitas surfboard shops, founded in 1961 and 1975, respectively. Within a short cruise up PCH, you'll find waves like Swami's, one of California's premier reef breaks, while just up the beach at Pipes, more first-time surfers are getting their stoke on than almost anywhere else in Southern California. We're from decidedly mellow breaks like Moonlight Beach, Beacons, and Grandview. Dynamic champions have emerged, from Linda Benson, who won her first U.S. championships back in 1959, to Alyssa Spencer, a former NSSA star who just won her first World Tour qualifying event in September. It seems while plenty of other California beach towns reluctantly put up with surfers, Encinitas actually seems fond of them, happily accommodating the area's pros, bros, gramps, girls, guys, and, well, this guy. Like we said, soul. We met up with Taylor Knox, a Momentum Generation carve guru and WSL tour vet, at his home break of Tamarack just north of Encinitas. We wanted to learn the ins and outs of the wave that helped develop him into a tour caliber surfer. Yeah, so when I was growing up, you know, this was like our, the main beach. It's where all the rad dudes would come, you know, all the older guys that ripped and surfed really good. And they would also be teaching us young bucks out of kit and, you know, what to do and what not to do in the lineup. Would you say this spot kind of helped birth your career? Like, is this where it started for you? Or For sure. The guys that I would watch, they were on tour, like Joey Baran was on tour and he won the Pipe Masters. They taught me work ethic. Tell me about this wave. It's got a couple different peaks. On my right is a spot that we call Bannings. It's a really fun left peak. It will connect with the main break, which we just call the rack, and that has a left and right off it as well. The left and the right will meet in, in the middle here in the shore break. It's kind of funny because, you know, your friend would take off way over there and you would take off way over here, but then you'd be coming at each other and it was like this game of chicken of like, who's gonna kick out <laughs> to get that last like hit on the, on the closeout. Taylor, tell us, like, if you're coming from out of town, what, what kind of board do you love to ride here? And, and what's kind of some local tips and tricks about the spot? What swell direction does it like? I'd say like a southwest swell. I'd bring a short board to, you can bring a fish if you wanted to. 
You can bring a longboard if you wanted to. I prefer a short board, some short and kind of wider and can be a little bit mushy sometimes. So you got to generate your own speed. What do you think it was about this wave that like produced some like tour level surfers? If you can surf good out here, you can surf anywhere. You know what I mean? Because this wave has a lot of moods and, and some are good and some are bad. But if you can tame and wrangle the bad ones and you know, make it look good, I think you got a shot at anywhere, anywhere on the QS. Yeah. <laughs> it's <been> training. <laughs> There's been a lot of talent that's walked through this town, that's for sure. Stoked to get a few laps in at Tamarack with Taylor. According to Taylor, best boards around a fish or a shortboard, best swell direction, south-southwest, best tide, medium, best time of the year, spring through fall, crowd factors, medium, skill level, intermediate to advanced. Hunter and I are on a quest to find the best post-surf burrito. Scoring them on the burrito meter, a non-scientific and completely biased rating system based on our taste buds. And what makes them happy. All right, so we just got done with the surf. After a surf, the one thing you want is a solid burrito. And we're at Fish 101, and we've got ourselves a couple burritos. Massive. This one was like the size of my head. It's huge. Lex has already eaten <laughs> half of hers and I caught ahead of the curve. Start. I got a head start. So we got fresh fish chips. The sauce is probably the best part of this burrito. It's pretty bomb. You know, I'm looking for a breakfast burrito most times after a surf, so that's where I'm like, okay, I got a cool fish burrito, but I'm leaving room for improvement. Well, this is a high seven. What's your take? I'm going to rate this one pretty high. I'm going to give it an 8.5. Wow. Yeah, post-surf burrito spot, definitely Fish 101 for Encinitas. Welcome to our food show. <laughs> It was important for Hunter and I to celebrate the unsung heroes, the diehards, and the ocean lovers who have been uniquely influential on the local surf culture over the decades, the saltiest locals. We're at Pipes right now. We're meeting up with Tim Hurley, yeah. someone you surf with regularly. What's your daily routine? What's your favorite spot here? What are your favorite boards? Oh, <laughs> favorite boards is a tough one because I make and ride those Elias, those wooden Elias. I like riding finless. Can you tell us a little bit about what it was like here in 1970 when you first started coming? You know, I personally like hippies, so there were a lot of hippies around. There's a lot of natural food stores, and La Paloma Theater is right there. That's got a rich history of showing surf films. I mean, I just appreciate interest in culture. There has to be art, there has to be music, there should be surfing and these different interests. So I started surfing when I was 10 years old in 1965. My dad bought a 10-3 Greg Knoll. It was a really beautiful board, but it was used. That was the beginning. But I was really lucky because the Shortburg Revolution happened exactly, exactly when I was coming through my teens. So just talk about an exciting time with exciting surfers like Wayne Lynch and Nat Young. And I just feel so fortunate that I grew up at that time. Thank you for all that you do and all that you have done and help to maintain the culture here in Encinitas. That's why we want to gift you this award for oh my gosh, saltiest wow. local. Oh my you gosh, salty. Encinitas, salty. I am local. salty, that's so true. <laughs> Comes with wow. a, your very own oh hydroplast my goodness. Wow. full of beautiful filtered water. This is just, <laughs> I'm overwhelmed. I just Thanks, love it. Tim. I just love it. Thank you, Thank you. Man. My pleasure. Thanks, my pleasure. Tim. Surf culture can only be as strong as the community that builds it. In looking forward, we wanted to recognize people and organizations that are striving to create a better world through surfing. Since we were already in Encinitas, where I'm lucky enough to call home, I wanted to show Hunter Sea and Soil, our DIY backyard garden collective just up the street from some of my favorite surf breaks. So this is your zone. It's just like a really big community effort. We wanted a space that we could tend together. We're growing enough food to be able to donate to the local food bank, as well as do a small CSA program. You know, we had a lot of free time during COVID, and this felt like the best therapy we could possibly have. We knew we wanted to grow a bunch of food, but it's crazy when you start to see how prolific the garden becomes, how much abundance there is, and it was a no-brainer that we wanted to feed people during the gnarliest time any of us have seen. 
maybe in our lifetimes. Yeah, yeah we've donated over 1,500 pounds already. It's 120 families in need. Oh, wow. Yeah, they're getting just the freshest organic, regenerative produce. I cried the first time we donated because I was just like, this is what it's all about, is yeah. feeding our friends, our community, but then also the community at large. Like you can see, we let it go a little bit wild. We kind of are of the ethos to just let the environment do its thing, let it be diverse. That's kind of the regenerative principles is bugs are a part of it, gophers are a part of it. So even though they are obstacles and challenges, we don't use any pesticides or chemicals. We kind of just let the ecosystem thrive and do its thing. Our lead farmer, Greg, he's uh, the mastermind behind all of it. That's the number one problem is over over fertilization because if you over fertilize then plants get weak and then you have to use a pesticide and it's just like a downward spiral of negative effects and the opposite is true when you have healthy soil practices the water infiltrates into the ground it filters out everything before it goes to the ocean the pesticides and fertilizers eventually runs off and goes down into the oceans so it's a huge problem when there's a minimal time between harvest and consumption, mm -hmm. that's when you get the healthiest food possible. And the only way to really do that is to have a lot of small-scale farms within sure. right where people live. Yeah. And that cuts out middlemen, and so that you have affordable food, and it's the most nutritious. It's just like a win-win. And the best part is you can walk to surf from this spot. That's so like rad. my two favorite waves in the whole world pipes and swamis, so. You just garden in the morning and surf in the afternoon. Sea and soil, baby, <laughs> can't beat it. So it's cool. the medicine. It actually looks kind of fun. We met up with Mario and the crew from Un Mar de Colores. A local nonprofit cultivating inclusivity, diversity, and ocean stewardship through surf therapy for underserved youth. So yeah, Mario, tell us a little bit about Un Mar de Colores. What does it mean? What does it mean to you? Why did you start it? Un Mar de Colores means an ocean of colors. We celebrate diversity and inspire inclusivity by providing free surf lessons for children of color and underserved youth. And at the core of Un Mar de Colores, we really just want to connect BIPOC, AAIP, LGBTQI kids to the ocean, and especially kids from historically marginalized communities who don't have access to the ocean. So we're that bridge. We want to be that family that invites these kids to the ocean. I'd say my favorite part about Umar de Colores is getting to surf. Yeah. And also the community. All right, awesome. So let's go ahead and grab a board and we'll get a partner, we'll get one of the mentors and we'll go out and surf. I think what's powerful with Umar is that most of the mentors that we have are other BIPOC surf instructors who just want to pay it forward. So the kids have someone that looks like them, teaching them. And as like an indigenous surfer, I think it's so important to act like an elder and keep teaching these kids why it's important to connect with the ocean. I hope to see these kids become teenagers and just like hopefully like Lizzie or Elroy end up in a surf competition or like just always taking their kids to the ocean, taking their friends to the ocean. But their success is my success with the program. Yeah, yeah well, we're stoked to be here today, dude. Thanks yeah, for thank having you, us. Thank you yeah. so much for coming out. It means a lot. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for having yeah. Yeah. Serving with the kids from Unmar was a highlight of the day for me. And getting to show Hunter some of my favorite parts of Encinitas gave me a new appreciation for what makes this town so unique. It's obvious to me now why some of the most stylish surfers to ever compete on the WSL Championship Tour call this place home. Next time on Detour Surf Towns, presented by Hydroflask. WSL Championship Tour surfer Courtney Conalog breaks down the wave that's been hosting the US Open for decades. We also meet up with the first ever world champion surfer Pete Townen and take a tour of the HB Surf Museum and Walk of Fame. He's like little Serrano peppers. You gotta do it with me, Lex. Oh. You have to. I'm not going alone. All right. Not to be deterred from the name, but those are called cobra peppers. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> 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 Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. Oh, yeah, this one's gnarly. Let's go surfing or something. Yeah. Indian for the water.